Okay, great. We are we are online and on video. Uh, great. So um, welcome everyone. Uh, Happy New Year. I hope you had uh, good holidays um, that you didn't gain too much weight, but uh, you know got a lot of energy and rested well. Um, so welcome back. It's a new exciting quarter. Um, welcome to CS246. Uh, uh, mining massive data sets is the is the course. Uh, my name is uh, Jure Leskovets. I'm the instructor for the course. I'm associate professor in computer science uh, doing research on these types of topics. Um, what I want to do today is uh, basically first talk about the, the administrative kind of operational part of the course. And then I want to do the first starter topic to kind of talk about uh, um, computational tools and architectures that we will use to analyze or make uh, big data uh, talk to us. So first, some motivation and then operational stuff. Um, otherwise, we, uh, I will just mention we prepared a handout for you. Most of you got it. If you don't have it, it will be at the back of the room at the end of the lecture or come to us and we'll give it to you. So uh, nothing is lost. All the slides are posted online um, so you can follow that as well. Okay, great. So um, uh, why is this exciting? Uh, the reason why this is exciting is, in some sense, it's for the first time in computing history, computers are not producing data, but computers are analyzing data, right? If you think about big computing in the past was about running some physics simulations uh, of airflow and explosions and things like that, right? So computers were producing data. Now for the first time, in some sense, in history, computers are not used to produce data. Computers are used to, to analyze uh, large amounts of data, right? When we today think of big, big computing, we think of computers analyzing large amounts of data. And you know, some people say data is the new electricity. Other people say data is power. But the bottom line is that data contains value and knowledge. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to extract this value and knowledge from data. And of course, the idea is that the more data I have, the more data I can process, analyze, the more value and knowledge I can extract from it, right? But this is a hard, this is a hard process, right? This, in order to extract this knowledge and, and make predictions, we need to be able to store these large amounts of data. We need to be able to manage these large amounts of data. And we need to be able to analyze it. And while, for example, how to store and build systems that can, that can store data is taught in the computer science systems classes, how the data is managed and indexed is taught in our uh, database classes. This class is about how do we analyze the data, right? So we will kind of assume we already know how to store it. We'll assume we know how to manage it. But now the question is what kind of methods, algorithms do we apply to extract value out of this data? And one thing I will say is that the following terms, in some sense, they are very much related, right? If you think about data mining, data mining is extracting knowledge from data. Then, you know, a few years later, the term big data became, po became very popular in a sense that if you have large amounts of data, you can extract more, uh, more out of it, right? Then from then, it's not just extracting kind of statically from the data, but it's also making predictions into the future. And people will, will, were calling this predictive analytics, right? Then, you know, the new term came out called data science, where the idea is can I extract knowledge, truth from the data? And then, of course, machine learning and AI are also, in some sense, just a sequence of progression of the same idea being re reincarnated. But it's all enabled by these three steps, that we finally have a lot of data and a lot of compute power. And by fusing the two together, magic can happen. That's essentially the bottom line, <clears throat> right? So what do we want to do? We want to extract actionable information, usually from very, very large data set that is, and this today, right, is subject to extreme hype, fear, and interest, right? It, all, all the three at the same time, right? It's not all about machine learning, um, but a lot or some of it is, but there is much, much more to it than that. And kind of what's the emphasis? The emphasis is on the scale, right? Even the, the latest kind of revolution that is happening in machine learning and, and, and deep learning and so on, it's a consequence of having large amounts of data and having the compute, right? So that is kind of the reason 
why things work so well as they do, because we are able to finally train models on large amounts of data and really fit the entire distribution, right? So th this course will focus on the issues of kind of how do we do with large big data sets and how do, and parallelization in these cases is often, is often uh, important. How can we break out the methods? We can break, break up the methods in terms of what we could call descriptive methods. This has, these are methods that, al that allows us to describe the structure of the data. So in some sense, find human interpretable patterns that describe what is happening in the data. Clustering, finding different classes types of, um, that, that appear in our data is an example of that. Or we can use predictive methods where what we want to do is, given some variables, we want to predict the others, right? We kind of want to predict the future or we want to predict something we haven't yet seen. Uh, a, a good example of this is recommender systems where given your history, I want to predict what movie are you going to like. And we will talk quite a bit about recommender systems. In the grand scheme of things, where does this class sit? I think a good way to think of it, it's, it sits in the intersection of kind of comp theoretical computer science in terms of algorithms and theory we'll be using, machine learning, statistical machine learning, and kind of systems, database systems for managing large data sets, right? And we will, we will move in this, in this area where we'll be using scalab scalable algorithms, machine learning models, plus kind of me methods to, uh, to, to process large amounts of data to do something useful. That's kind of the, the way to think uh, of this course. Um, what will we learn? We will learn how to extract value, make predictions from different types of data. We'll talk about super high dimensional data. We'll talk about when data is a graph. We'll talk about when data is infinite or never ending. This means data is a stream, so you never, you never see all of it. Um, and when kind of data is labeled or the data is unlabeled. We will also talk about different computing architectures that allow us to process this data. <coughs> we'll talk about MapReduce as a distributed framework to, to easily write programs that allow us to process a lot of data. We'll talk about streaming and online algorithms. These are algorithms that see kind of one data point at a time, decide something and kind of throw it away because the new one is coming. And uh, we'll also talk about kind of single machine in memory algorithms, kind of classical stuff. Um, we will also talk a lot about different real world problems, right? So we'll take these different types of data, different types of computing architectures and connect them to different real world problems. We'll talk a lot, as I mentioned, about how do you build the real uh, recommender systems. We'll talk about something that is called mar market basket analysis. We'll talk about spam detection. We'll talk about kind of web search and duplicate document detection and many other things. And of course, We'll also learn various tools that allows us to do this, kind of tools in terms of mathematical tools. We'll be using quite a lot of linear algebra <coughs> in terms of um, singular value decomposition. So this will be uh, an important tool that will allow us to solve recommender systems. We'll talk about optimization methods for large scale. In particular, the, um, it's simple but um, extremely useful stochastic gradient descent. We'll talk about dynamic programming and we'll be using a lot of hashing, especially for bloom filters and locality sensitive hashing. So this is kind of a CS theory type of machinery. This is also algorithmic machinery. This is from optimization. This is from linear algebra, right? So again, we'll be, we'll be taking methods coming from many different uh, uh, areas of, let's say, of computing. How does the class structure look like? Here is how the class is, is organized in terms of what will we learn about processing high dimensional data, graph data, um, data streams, uh, we'll talk about machine learning, and then we'll also talk about some applications of these methods to these particular uh, domains. So that's kind of the entire class uh, uh, for or entire quarter on one slide. What do I want you to be at the end? I want you kind of to be like this, right? Like so if you have some data, Somebody comes to you and says, I have this data, you'll be like, how do you want it? What do you want, right? Like medium rare, do you want, you know, sausages, what do you want? <laughs> so this is what, you know, I hope you, you are this master chef who just like, you know, single-handedly does everything. So uh, it will be awesome, good. So um, now uh, course logistics and how, how we are going to do this. 
So it will be a busy quarter and we have a really super awesome um, uh, TA team. We have, we have 12 TAs, uh, most of them are here and we have Michele who will be my co-instructor and the head TA and will help run and coordinate everything. Um, do maybe you guys want to stand up, whoever is here or raise your hand. So this is Michele, you will see him quite a lot and let's say there are other people around. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, then we will be holding office hours. Uh, we will uh, send the, the schedule, post it on, on, uh, on our website. We will start office hours next week. Our goal is to hold two office hours per day and probably one office hour over the weekend so that you are really well taken care of. Um, I will hold my office hours on Tuesdays 9 to 10 a.m. Um, Michele has office hours on Thursdays 5 to 7 uh, p.m. For SCPD students, people that are remote, uh, use Google Hangout, the link is posted on Piazza, right? Our goal is to make you learn as much as possible and to support you in the learning process. This is a quite non-trivial class, so it requires a lot of work, but, but it's our responsibility as the teaching team to allow you to gain all the skills and be able to kind of complete the class even if it may be very challenging and very hard. But we are here to support you, so come to us because we want to make your experience good and we want you to learn and kind of excel beyond what you thought is possible for you. So we really want to, we want to help you, all right? In terms of resources, there is a course website on, there will be posted in, posting lecture slides. Um, generally, I'll post the first version the night before and then the final version will be posted just before because I usually do little tweaks to the lecture. Um, we'll be also posting some readings, homeworks and solutions we will, mo we will most likely be posting on Piazza so that it's not public for uh, people who are not in the, enrolled in the class to, uh, to download and save for the future. We'll be using the textbook book called M Mining of Massive Datasets. Uh, you can buy paper if you like or you can get uh, free PDFs out of this uh, URL. Um, and basically for every lecture there is a chapter in the book. The book is a really good companion uh, to the class. If you'd like to preview uh, topics of the class, there is a MOOC based on, on the CS246. You can find the videos there. <coughs> now, um, we will also organize three special tutorials in the first two weeks of the course. First one will be about Spark. Spark is a system, a distributed system that allows us to analyze or work with large amounts of data. And then we will have two theory based recitations, one about linear algebra and um, one about probability uh, and, and statistics and proof techniques. This is just for people who are rusty. Uh, it will be useful to bring everyone on the same page. Spark uh, tutorial is something I think will be very useful for everyone. Uh, we have fixed the dates. We have fixed the time, so it means it's right after the lecture. We haven't fixed the location. We will let you know. Yes. Great. Yes. All the all the all these sessions will be recorded, and the videos will be posted as part of the SCPD thing. So yes, everything will be recorded. Thank you for the question. All right. Good. Um, now, how do you communicate with us? The most important thing is that we use Piazza. Make sure you log in. Make sure you read it. Um, and that's the, the main part um, of where we will be doing communication. If you need to reach any of us, don't send us email individually. Like really, don't, if you want to send me an email, don't send it to me. Send it to the mailing list, right? N don't contact people individually, use the mailing list. Um, generally, you shouldn't need to send us email because you can ask questions through Piazza. Uh, we will post course announcements, any kind of homework corrections and so on uh, through Piazza. We will have people, uh, TAs dedicated to Piazza monitoring. Our goal is to have an average response time of less than 20 minutes. So you shouldn't need to wait for your questions to be answered. Um, if there are people who are auditing, you are welcome to sit in, uh, welcome to the class. So no need to worry about that. Uh, one thing about Piazza, Piazza I think is very important that we think of Piazza as a forum where we can kind of help each other and answer each other's questions. So Piazza is not a place where the TA team is answering questions, but Piazza is a place where you guys can answer each other's questions. And the TA team can come and then, I don't know, endorse the answers and so on. So it's very important for everyone to participate on Piazza. <coughs> 
and, um, and in some sense answer each other questions and doubts. This way, the communication will be much faster, and this way, um, you won't have to wait for us to answer your questions. <coughs> Sorry. So this is important, and we'll give um, extra credit uh, based on that. Hey, Michele, could you get me some water? <coughs> how, how will the work for the class look like? We will have four large homeworks. Um, each one will account for 10% of the grade. Um, <coughs> the first homework, which is called homework zero, it's basically a Spark tutorial is already posted. It's a very short homework. It should take you about one to two hours to complete, but um, it's important for you to complete it because, again, it will allow us to troubleshoot any problems you have uh, with the software. Um, otherwise, the big homeworks will take lots of time. Usually people need about 20 hours per homework. So the important thing is to start early and not start too late. Homeworks are submitted through Gradescope. Uh, here is the course code that you can use. And then please make sure to upload your code um, um, uh, on this website. The reason we do this, you upload your code because we check your code against plagiarism. I'll talk about honor code more later. Uh, here's the schedule. Basically, um, homework zero is out. And then homeworks will be out on uh, Thursdays. And then they will be due on Thursdays um, two weeks later. There are four homeworks. The quarter is um, uh, 10 weeks. So every two weeks there is a homework. Um, <coughs> we allow you to do two late periods, to use two late periods. Basically, if you want to take a late period, you just submit late. Uh, submitting late means you have to submit by Monday at uh, midnight Pacific time. So rather than submitting on Thursday, midnight, you will be submitting um, uh, your homework uh, on Monday. So you get three extra days, and for two of those homeworks, you can get to do that. Per homework, you can use one late period, right? We won't accept your homework after this date. Um, thank you. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. Then another part of the course is uh, what we call gradient squeezes. And um, gradient quizzes is that every week there will be a short quiz. Uh, these are electronic quizzes. And then uh, we will generally release these quizzes on Tuesday. And then they will, be, they will be due nine days later on Thursday again at midnight. Um, it is super important to note that the system does not allow me to, 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 to give you any grace period. After this time, it's over, right? Like really, I cannot do anything. It's, it's written, like it doesn't even allow me to, to extend the, the submission date. I cannot do anything. So really, the, it's a really, really hard deadline, right? Um, again, the first quiz has already been posted. How do you register? Either please use your SUNET ID or use your legal first name underscore legal, your legal last name. Why do we care? Because at the end, we have to match your gradients, usernames with your Stanford IDs to compute your grade. So, and we do this based on the username. So either please do this. Um, this is important, especially um, for people who have, let's say, I don't know, Spanish or Asian names that are very long. And then, you know, somebody is called Johnny, but really they are Jonathan. Make sure that you use whatever is your real name in the passport and whatever is your name in the Stanford register. And don't call yourself Johnny, okay? Because we won't know who you are. Um, and then you can do this, uh, you can do this here. Um, what is about these quizzes? These are quizzes that you can submit as many times as you like, but uh, every time the answers uh, change and the parameters of the question change. So um, you can submit as often as you want. You won't be penalized for multiple submissions. The only thing that counts is the score on the most recent submission. So one advice is that after you got a perfect score, don't submit another one where it's zero, okay? It's not smart to do that, okay? Um, and then, as I said, after the due date, you can see the solutions of the problems, but you will be only able to see the solutions if you submit it at least once. Um, why am I saying this is that if you don't, if you forget to submit the quiz 
and then later on you come to us and say, hey, I want to see the quizzes because I want to study for the final, you won't be able to see the results because you haven't submitted. So make sure to submit every quiz at least once. You can submit as often as you want. Uh, most recent submission counts. Um, more about gradients. Um, the best strategy is that you should work out each problem um, independently and, and then submit at once. Um, this way, right, um, you won't have to repeat the questions because if you get something wrong, the entire quiz gets regenerated and everything will change. So the best thing is to sol solve everything and then submit. Um, and there is a 10 minute delay between the submissions to kind of prevent people from just randomly trying, okay? Uh, but you will get a sense it's actually quite cool and the technology behind it is using some finite automata to figure out how to change the questions from, from trial to trial. Okay, and then the last part is um, final exam. The date has been set, it's March 19, uh, 3.30 to 6.30, location will be figured out. Uh, we don't have a plan for an alternative final, but if you feel that, you know, you can really not make this time, we will figure something out. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we will give extra credit uh, up to 1% of the grade for participating in Piazza discussions. Um, especially valuable are answers to, to questions of other students um, and for reporting bugs in the course material. So if you find bugs, let us know. We want to fix them so that people are not confused. So prerequisites. Um, we expect relatively strong programming background, either in Python or Java. Um, we, you need some basic algorithms background, so this will be CS 161 is more than sufficient. <coughs> For probability, CS 109 or st stats, um, 116 is um, the, the uh, good. Uh, there will be review sessions that bring you to the same level. Uh, linear algebra, we will post some review session and review documents. And uh, for multivariable calculus and database systems, you know, if you took 145, that is sufficient, the sufficient but not necessary. So these are things um, you, can, you can pick up, right? Um, you can ask yourself, okay, but what if I don't know all this stuff you mentioned? Um, each of the topics that I listed is important uh, for kind of a small part of the, of, the, of the course. So don't worry, you will always be able kind of to catch up or build up that part of the skill, right? So if you are missing an item of background, you, you know, you can consider it kind of just in time learning and you will be fine. Um, what is important, the, the exception is programming, right? If you, to do well in this course, at the end you will need to write some software. Not huge amounts of it, but you need to be comfortable writing code in Python or Java, right? Like, I don't know, this much code, whatever that means, right? Like, so it's good that you have written code in the past, um, right? So uh, one more thing is the Stanford Honor Code that um, you all, I'm sure, are familiar with, but um, we will follow the standard kind of computer science department approach, uh, which means you can get you can get help, but you must acknowledge the help um, that you that you received, right? The failure to acknowledge uh, who you discussed your homeworks with is a is a basically is a is a violation of Stanford Honor Code, and and lots of bad things can follow from that. We will be using MOS to check um, plagiarism of the code. Um, so again, this is usually another place where uh, a lot of this honor, honor code uh, uh, violations happen when people have, have identical code or they have code that they downloaded from some GitHub repository on the web or they have code that is similar to one of the previous year's uh, submissions and so on. So all this is an honor code violation. So write your own code. Don't copy other people's code. Um, how about homeworks? Forum groups and, 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 and do the, and, 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 and help each other, I think is important, right? So it means you can talk to each other about algorithms to be used in, in the homework and so on, but you have to uh, mention who you talked to and you have to produce your solution yourself, right? So you should not use the code of others um, uh, when you write, but you should write your own code, right? You can talk to people, but you have to write your own code. 
Um, if, and again, if you fail to mention your sources, your, in some sense, people you discuss with, again, and, and, and most, most catches you, you will be again charged with an honor code violation. And, and it's unpleasant for everyone, okay? Um, one more thing I should mention, we also have what we call uh, 246H, which is a sister class to CS246. Uh, 246H runs on Wednesdays, <laughs> and um, what it covers is one lecture a week. It's a one unit course that basically goes deep into the internals of distributed systems used for data processing. So it talks about Hadoop file systems, talks about MapReduce, talks about Spark, um, talks about a lot about kind of um, um, kind of um, more advanced techniques and operators that, that appear in these systems, um, right? So in some sense, 246 discusses theory and algorithms. <coughs> 246H tells you how to implement them. Um, the instructor is Daniel Templeton from Cloudera, um, and also 46 lectures are recorded, so you will be able to, uh, to watch them. <coughs> <coughs> what, um, one last thing I wanna say, what happens after the course? After the course, we are running what we call CS341, projects in mining massive data sets, where you can take the knowledge you took in this class and bring it to practice, which basically means is that we go and collect interesting large scale data sets. You guys form groups of three. We will provide data, computing resources, and mentoring to work on a 10 week data intensive research project, basically. Um, and then we also have RA positions open for people who are interested in that. So to, uh, to conclude, what are some final, final, final thoughts? CS246 is quite fast paced. Right, requires programming maturity and uh, strong math uh, skills. Um, course time commitment is about 20 hours for homeworks. Gradients quizzes take about one to two hours per week. Uh, there, is, there is 10 of them and I suggest you form study groups. Um, but you know what's important? It's going to be f a lot of fun and uh, a lot of hard work. To summarize what you guys need to do, you need to go and register on Piazza. You need to go register on Gradescope. You need to go register on Gradients. Um, and you, you need to go to uh, complete the homework zero, the Spark tutorial. This homework is really meant to be a time homework, so it should take about one to two hours to complete. Um, other homeworks will be much harder, right? But if this, is, if this homework is challenging for you, if it takes you 20 hours to complete, then this class is probably not for you, okay? So um, that's what to say. Anything more is here. If you have additional questions, um, let me know. Are there any questions? Okay, um, no questions. So now I'll start with my uh, starter topic, okay? I wanna talk about um, large scale distributed systems for processing data. The way this looks like uh, today, it looks like this. It's basically huge data centers of commodity machines wired together in, um, with a commodity network, right? So uh, large scale computing infrastructure for data mining problems on commodity hardware. This is how, right? So in some sense, we are not using supercomputers, but we are using commodity hardware, lots of small machines connected together through the network, right? What are some challenges? The challenges are how do you distribute computation? How can you make it easy to write software that runs over these thousands or tens of thousands of machines? And then what do you do when machines fail, right? So here's a simple calculation. Im imagine one server fails every three years. That's let's say 1,000 days before the server fails. If you have 1,000 servers, then you can expect one failure per day, right? But if you have a million servers, uh, then thousand machines will fail every day, right? So kind of it's a fact of the world that machine fails all the time, right? So you have to have software written in such a way that it's resilient to when machines fail. And I'll talk to, to you about that, right? So how do we deal with that, right? Um, one issue is that copying data over the network 
takes a lot of time, right? So you could say, here I have the storage, here I have analysis, so I have to take this data from the storage, bring it to the analysis, and take the result back. And that takes a lot of time. So what is the idea? The idea is to bring computation to the data, right? So basically, to store files um, locally, and then com and do the computation uh, where the files are. And then, how do you deal with failures? The idea is to store the same file in multiple locations, so that it, if machi one machine goes down, that information is stored somewhere else as well, right? And Spark and Hadoop are the two systems that are built to solve or kind uh, this type of problems, so that as a let's say as a as an engineer or as a as a scientist, you ha don't have to wor worry about these low level details, right? So what do they do? They provide you a storage infrastructure or a file system. So for example, Google has its own file system called GFS. Hadoop has a file system called HDFS. Um, they give you the file system and they give you the programming model, like the MapReduce programming model I'll talk to you about, or the Spark programming model. So you as a programmer, you just write in this programming model. You don't have to worry about how the files are partitioned, how they are stored, what happens if machines fail, and so on and so forth. Okay? So first, let's talk about storage, right? The, the question is, if a node, if a machine fails, um, how, 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 how do I store data uh, persistently? And the answer is, use a distributed file system, where basically you have uh, a global file namespace, but the files are stored in a distributed way. And a typical usage pattern is that you have huge files, maybe uh, files that are of size of hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes, so you have these huge files. Um, and these files don't change, right? So kind of the data is uploaded only once, and then what you do with the data, you apply reads and appends to the data. Okay, so these files kind of only grow or are generally static, but you read them multiple times because you analyze that set of data. Okay, that's the, that's the kind of the, the usage pattern. So how does uh, Hadoop generally deal with this? You have this notion of a chunk server. Okay, so a, a huge file is split into multiple chunks, and each chunk is relatively small. You know, it used to be between 16 and 64 megabytes. I think today the chunks are, are bigger, but they are relatively small compared to the full um, data size. And then each chunk is re replicated multiple times and saved on multiple different uh, uh, machines. And, and what they even try to do, they try to make sure that the, the, that these replicas are not even on the same rack or in the same box, um, but that they are really distributed across the data center. So even if one part of the data center go, goes down, the data is not lost, right? These are the chunk servers. And then you have the master node. Uh, in Hadoop, it's called the name node. And this stores the data, the metadata, and uh, it stores the information where all the chunks are saved um, and so on. And many times you want to have your name node replicated or duplicated as well, because if it goes down, you, you lost the map where the data is stored, okay? Um, and then the last thing you need is a client library to access files, right? And this basically, this library talks to the, to the master node, to the name node, to find the correct chunk server, and then goes to the chunk server to obtain the data f um, uh, to, uh, to do access, okay? So, Basically, what this allows you to do is to have a reliable distributed file system where data is kept in chunks spread across multiple machines. Uh, each chunk is replicated in many different machines. So if one machine fails, when it wakes up, it can go to the name node and say, okay, what are the chunks I am supposed to have? And then copies the, the, chunk, the, the corresponding chunks from the machines that have them to kind of rebuild itself, right? Um, so the way you can think of this is that you have these chunk servers, these are our nodes, and then, you know, these are different chunks, and, you know, chunk D0 is stored here, here, and here, and chunk C1, you know, is stored multiple times, let's say, here in two cases, right? So now, if one machine goes down, no, no data gets lost because, you know, C1 is stored here, C0 is there, and so on and so forth. But kind of, you get the idea. So now, I told you how the data is stored across thousands of machines, and this provides, this distribution provides reliability. 
Now, what I need to do, the second thing is that now I want to compute over this. And the idea is not that I have the files, the servers that store files, and then, you know, I know here on this side, right here, I have data that uh, servers that do compute, and these servers that do compute would go to these chunk servers, get the data, and do compute. The idea is that the chunk servers also serve as compute servers, right? So that each of these guys is also doing computation on the data. So the data does not leave the machine. That's the idea. Yes, Camila. What if computing on a chunk in a given server requires information that's from a chunk on a different server? Um, what if a uh, uh, compute computing on one server requires uh, data from a chunk on, on a different server? Um, it is no problem. Uh, one server can request that data, right? Um, but that's your problem as a programmer that this will be inefficient, and you you will you will want to spend a bit more time to make sure maybe you don't do that, okay? But um, I I will come to that, and it will actually answer your question in a different way, okay? Good question, super. So now that we know how the data is stored. We need to be able to write programs that compute over this data, kind of what Camilo was saying. And um, there is uh, this way of writing distributed software called MapReduce that is basically a programming model designed for easy parallel programming, uh, invisible management of hardware and software uh, uh, failures. Um, easy management of large scale data, um, and this MapReduce model has several implementations, including uh, Hadoop, which is the open source thing, Spark, which is what we'll be using in class, uh, there is Flink, uh, another open source MapReduce implementation, but the original MapReduce was implemented in Google, and there is a famous paper called um, MapReduce. So MapReduce was kind of the first implementation of this paradigm was at Google, and then these are kind of the successors that are open source versions of that. So now how does this MapReduce programming model look like? <coughs> okay? So MapReduce says that you can write programs that operate in three steps. And here is what the, how these programs operate, right? You have map phase, you have the group by key phase, and you have the reduce phase. <coughs> <coughs> Let me explain. So what is a map phase? Map phase will go and apply a user written, so a programmer written map function to each input element. So this means that the mapper applies a map function to a single, um, to a single element, um, and uh, multiple of these mappers can be mapped into, can be combined into a map task, which is kind of one unit of parallelism. Um, and the output of the map functions is a set of key value pairs. Okay, so the idea is that you can read the data, and in the map function, you somehow transform it to up output the key value pairs. What happens then is the second step, which the system does for you, and this is group by key. So basically, it will take these key value pairs, and it will sort and shuffle them so that it groups uh, all the values does that belong to the same key, right? So the system will go and sort all the key value pairs and give you the output will be key and a list of values, okay? Yes? No? Can I, can people give some feedback? Is it clear what I'm saying? Okay, awesome, thank you. And then now the last step, which is also written by the programmer, is the reduce step. And the reduce function will now go and for every key, get this set of values and somehow aggregate them into some useful information, okay? So as a, as a programmer, you write two functions. You write the map function and you write the reduce function. That's all you can do. And um, what this means is that outline of all map reduce jobs is the same. What changes is the map function and the reduce function. And the system will do the group by key step for free, yes. <coughs> a function can output multiple values? A function can output <laughs> multiple key value pairs, yes. Okay, let me give you an example how would, how would this work, right? The way you can think of this is the following, right? Like, and how, why is this so useful? 
you can think you have a huge input file. You can think this huge input file is set, is somehow split into chunks, right? The idea is that the map, that the map task will read its part of the input file and it will output some key value pairs. And then, you know, some other map function will output some other key value pairs. And then some other map function, other key value pairs. Then you will get the group by key, right? After all these map functions are complete, the group by key will, uh, will happen where, you know, for key one, we collect all the values. For key two, we collect all the values. For key three, all the values, and so on and so forth. And now, for every of these guys, a reduce function will be called that will take these values and somehow reduce them to something else. And that's the final output, okay? So as a programmer, you get to write two things. You get to write the map function and you get to write the reduce function. And that's, um, and that's it. Why is this useful? Because you can do this in parallel, right? If these are our um, uh, chunk servers, what you can do is you can run multiple map functions on each chunk server separately, and all, all this data processing happens in parallel. All these key value pairs get output. <coughs> and what happens then <coughs> is that <coughs> is the um, group by key that happens in here when uh, basically then the reduce tasks get run after all the mapper tasks have been run. And again, certain keys can be sent to one reduce task server and certain key values can be sent to the second reduce task server, right? But the point is that all this computation up here over this giant file can happen in parallel and then all these reduces can happen, can happen in parallel. <coughs> yes? So all the math functions have to be done first. So if we have one that takes longer than all the other ones, that's the slowest link. Great. So, uh, super cool, cool question, right? So the question was, all the map functions have to be done before you can start reducing. Correct. So what do you do? And many times you may have one machine that is super sluggish. So what happens then is that the master who's coordinating all these jobs notices that maybe this map task on this chunk is very slow. So what you can do is you find some other chunk server where this chunk is saved and run the same map task on that machine on, that, on the same chunk and maybe that will finish faster and you just kill this task, right? So you have this problem that, you know, just one machine and one task can be super sluggish, but because you have that same chunk saved in multiple times, you can preemptively start the same task on those chunks and maybe one of them will finish faster. So you can then start doing the group by key and the reducers can start doing the work. But you are right, right? Like the blocking part is that all the mappers have to finish before you can start reducing, right? The reason is because Maybe this guy outputs, you know, some value that needs to be added here. So we cannot start reducing before everyone has finished. That's a great question, actually, super cool. All right, good, yes. Uh, what are common keys that are used to, to group these? Great, um, I know this is very abstract right now. I will give you examples about what can you do with this, okay? So I'll come to that. Uh, there was someone here, yes. What happens after reduce? What happens after reduce? Um, you know, after reduce, we are done and we go get a beer. <laughs> right, but really what happens after reduce is that you can have another map task, right? So you can chain these things together, but this is one step, okay? So um, kind of what's the pattern? The pattern is that the input get, gets mapped through these mappers, then the group by key happens, so that the right keys are sent to the right reducers and then there is the output. And this is one map reduce job, right? But you can of course chain multiple together if you like, okay? Um, now giving, you were asking there, give you some examples of map reduce tasks. So here is the, the kind of the prototypical example. It's a, it's a work counting example. Imagine you have a huge text document. <coughs> Maybe you have, um, all the, all the web or all the books ever written in one file. And you wanna count how many times does each word appear in this huge document, okay? Um, and there are many applications of this, right? So for example, you may say, oh, I have web server access logs 
and I want to find how many times each URL appears in that access log. That's the same as kind of word counting example. Or you say, I want to do statistical machine translation. If I need, if I want to do that, I need to count the number of times every five word sequence appears, I don't know, on the web or in a collection of books. Again, this is, this is a word counting example, right? So the idea is, I have a huge document and I want to find how often does, I know in this case each five sequence, five word sequence or one word sequence, how often does it appear? How would you do this in MapReduce, right? The way to think of this is here is some document, right? This is our huge big document, our huge big file. And what we will do is if we apply map task to it, our map task will be very simple. The map task will read a word and output that word as a key with value one. Okay, so I will take the and output the comma one. Then I will say crew and I will output crew comma one. And then off, you know, off comma one. You get the idea, right? Like so my mapper will go take every word and use the word as the key and value of one as a value, okay? Then what will happen? What happens is that now the group by key happens, right? So basically this, this, val this set of key value pairs will get sorted, okay? So, you know, all the crew appearances of the word crew will come together, uh, all the appearances of, of the word the will come together and so on and so forth. So now when the reducer gets, gets uh, called, all the reducer will say is, oh, here are all the occurrences of the word the, one, two, three, I will output the comma three, okay? And what have we just done? We have just counted how often does each word appear in this, in this huge document, okay? Yes? It doesn't seem like you can like um, reverse, like get the original text from the reduce. <coughs> Sorry? Can you get the original text from the reduce? No, you, you, you can't. You, what, like can you get the original text from the reduce? That's not our task. Our task is to count how often does each word appear. Uh, okay. Right, I just want to count how often does each word appear. And how do I do this? In the map reduce framework, I write the map task that takes a word and outputs this as a key comma value one. Then the group by key will group all the, all the, all the same words together. So the reducer just goes, sums up the values and output the word comma the sum. And that's it, right? Um, yes. Where does the group by key operation happen? Uh, is it taken uh, care of by the- Great. Sternal? Good question. So where does the group by key operation happen? This is provided to you by the system. So this is what the system implements for you is this thing and, uh, and it executes the, ta the, the map task that you write and the reduce task that you write, right? So um, what is important to notice here is that the way I explain this now, this is all sequential, right? This only requires sequential reads, right? I'm reading this, uh, uh, um, Word by word, I'm outputting this thing uh, key, key value one by one. Then this, this group by happens that, I, that the system provides for me so I don't have to worry about it. And then all I have to do is again just sequentially go over this file. Whenever I see the new word, I keep going, I count how many lines I see and I output. It's like the simplest way to do the word count. No hash table, no, no dictionary, nothing, nothing, right? I need no memory, right? Why does the reduce have to happen after everything's finished? Couldn't it consolidate the data before it transfers it? Uh, why does the reduce have to happen before? It has to happen afterwards. Well, it yeah. needs to happen before as well because you see the three times. So rather than saying the, the one, the one, the one, why can't you say the three and then send that so it's shorter? Uh, great. Uh, super uh, good observation, right? It seems a bit silly to output these things three times. Uh, there are this, this, th there is this notion of a combiner that that's exactly what you said. But it's just an optimization. This is kind of theory, okay? So now how do you do this in parallel? You can chunk, you can split this big document into chunks. You run a mapper here, it does its outputs. You run in parallel a mapper here, it does the outputs. You run another parallel mapper here, parallel mapper here. They all do these outputs. After they all finish, you do the group by, and then you can again just uh, run the reducers in parallel, right? So you see how this is trivially parallelizable, okay? So, right, 
Now each mapper outputs different key value pairs. Then there is this blocking where all these guys have to finish that it, that the, that the, um, that the group by key happens. And then again, you can partition these outputs so that, you know, all these data gets sent to one reducer, all these data gets sent to another reducer, so they give you the final, uh, the final word count. And I just want to give you the pseudocode. This is the, this is the pseudocode, right? Like the, what does the mapper do? The mapper says, for each, wo for each word, imagine that what you get key value for the mapper is line number and the entire line in that file. You say for all, for each word in that line, output word comma one. And then what, how does the reducer look like? The reducer says, right, it gets the word ID and a list of values, a list of ones. And all you have to do is you say for each count in, 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 uh, in values, uh, result is plus equal that value and output the word comma result, right? It's as trivial as possible, right? With, you know, these five lines of code, you can write, uh, you can, you can, you can now do the word count over uh, terabytes of data, okay? So what does the MapReduce environment take care of, right? So the first thing it takes care of is partitioning this input data across multiple servers. The second thing it does takes care of is, um, is scheduling the program execution across a set of machines. Um, it's performing the group by key step for us, um, right? And in practice, this group by key is the bottleneck because a lot of data has to be swapped across the machines. It's handling machine failures, um, and it's uh, managing all the communication between the machines. So me as a programmer literally have to write, you know, these four lines, and I can, I can run this over all the web pages on the web and just sit back and relax, right? So this is why this is so amazing because so little code allows you to, um, to then efficiently write a job that, that runs over tens of thousands of machines. Yes? Is the grouping actually grouping keys or is it more of a virtual grouping where it kind of keeps them separated and just, I guess, to the user pretends that they're on the same machine? Um, it really... It, it really is a group by. I think what they really do is they sort. I think the Hadoop really just runs the sort of your mapper outputs, and that basically means that all the keys, uh, all the keys with the same value are grouped together. So it's really physically sorting it. So the way the Hadoop does it. Um, and I will come to that. It's a good question because other systems don't do it. Um, I, I'll, I'll address your question. It's a good one. Yes. Why doesn't the keys need to be like sortable? Are there any other requirements on what the key is to be like viable for a MapReduce task? Like hashable or? No? Keys, uh, it doesn't really matter. Oh. Key is a set of bits. Like you don't need, you don't care, right? Like it's a set of bits so that you can say, are two keys equal or are they different? That's all you need to know. Nothing else matters, right? And your keys can be whatever you like. It's a sequence of bits. That's all they need to be. I'm, I'm not sure what else they would be in a, on a computer, right? Sequence of bits is, there is nothing else than that, right? So there is no special requirement for keys. Yes? Is there a particular like sort algorithm that is used by these systems? Like is merge sort more used because the data is already? Great, so you're asking me lots of uh, details about what kind of sort algorithms are used. I, <coughs> I think, so as I said, I think Hadoop is really using sort, and I think they were using some kind of distributed merge sort, if I remember correctly. But things can, may, may have changed. The best way for you to get these answers is to go tomorrow to 246H and talk to Daniel, because he's a real expert, and he will love your question. All right, great, awesome. <clears throat> okay, so um, how do we deal with failures? Dealing with failures is easy, because right, if a, if a machine fails that is running a mapper task, then it's easy, we just rerun that mapper somewhere else, wherever that chunk that original machine was having um, is stored. Um, and then, right, if this happens, um, and uh, reduce workers are notified so that they know that they have to wait for that task to be rescheduled and, and, and rerun. What is more harder is if a reducer fails. If a reducer fails, then, um, only in progress tasks need to be reset and the reduce task needs to be restarted, right? So um, reduce, reducer failures are a bit harder. 
But this is now what I told, explained to you is the basic old school MapReduce model, I think from 2004 if I remember correctly, right? So like ages ago, okay? So now something more modern. Something that is more modern is called Spark. Spark is trying to solve two major problems with MapReduce. First is that so even though the MapReduce programming model is amazingly um, useful um, and elegant, it's also um, someti sometimes difficult, right? Many problems are not really described well in this MapReduce uh, framework. They don't lend themselves into the separation of the map and the reduced tasks. And um, there are quite a few performance bottlenecks because, um, um, beca because of this, because you have to kind of um, make tricks to make the map reduce work uh, on certain problems, um, then performance is not satisfactory. Um, and then the other thing is Hadoop tends to um, persist everything back to disk. Um, and, and this makes Hadoop in some sense relatively slow or map reduce relatively sl slow. And then the second thing is um, map reduce does not compose well for large applications. What I mean by this is uh, you ask me a question about what happens after one map reduce step. What happens is that many times you want to now run the second map reduce task. And um, you want to chain multiple of these tasks together and uh, map reduce or Hadoop doesn't do this well because it loads the data, does the thing, dumps the data. And then the next task has to load that data again, do the thing and dump it. So you are spending lots of time just dumping the data on the disk and reading it off the disk. So here is where um, Spark or what is called data flow systems um, come into play. And uh, the difference is the following, that MapReduce system uses kind of two ranks or two types of tasks, right? It uses the map tasks followed by the, by the reduced tasks. Um, and the data flows from the first one, from the map, to the, to the second one, to the reduce. And data flow systems kind of try to get away with this limitation. <coughs> <coughs> so data flow systems generalize this in two ways. First, they allow for any number of tasks or ranks, right? They allow functions other than map and reduce. Um, and uh, as long as the data flow is in one direction, um, we can have what we call the blocking property and allow of recovery of tasks rather than need to restart the whole job, right? So if you have data only flowing one way and something fails, then you can just restart from the failure point and continue. That's generally the idea, okay? So um, Spark is the most popular data flow system. Um, it is expressive um, computing system, not limited only to the MapReduce model. What does it allow us to do? Um, it basically has the kind of the MapReduce, but other things as well. It allows us to have fast data sharing. It avoids saving intermediate results to disk which is good from the performance point of view. It caches data for repetitive operations. Um, it allows us to have general execution graphs. I'll give you an example later where basically I said the data flow has to be one way. This means that the data flow is a, is a DAG, is a direct and a cyclic graph, right? And basically you have these jobs that send data to each other and you just execute that, okay? Um, it allows us to have richer functions than just map and reduce. And it's also kind of compatible um, with Hadoop, right? This is open source written in, in Java. Basically it supports Java, Scala, and Python. Um, and the key construct or the key idea is something that they call RDD or Resilient Distributed Data Set, which is basically a chunk of data that is, that is kept, uh, kept in memory and passed around. And, um, they also provide very nice high level app, uh, APIs in terms of what, what is called data frames um, and data sets, which is um, introduced in the recent versions. And there's a lot of additional packages to do machine learning and SQL and so on and so forth. So um, I'll just quickly talk about the RDD. So this resilient distributed data set. This is basically a partitioned collection of, uh, of records. Um, and basically it's, it generalizes uh, key value pairs. 
um, and it is spread across the cluster and it is read only, right? Um, and it is cached uh, in, the, in the memory, right? So um, you can also persist it to disk, but generally you keep everything in memory. So, um, and the idea is that this RDDs can be created from Hadoop or by transforming other RDDs, right? So the idea is that you have kind of a block of key value pairs, you apply some function to them, and you get a new block of key value pairs. And these RDDs are then kind of being, being um, transformed, moved around, um, and so on, right? And these RDDs are best suited for applications that apply the same operations to all, all elements of that RDD or of the data set, right? And now, what kind of operations can you, can you, or what can you do with the, uh, with the RDDs? What kind of operations can you do? You can do transformations, right? Which are basically um, you, uh, where, where you build a new RDD based on a um, um, deterministic operation on, of the other RDD, right? So these operations include map, filter, join, union, uh, intersection, and distinct. Um, and everything is done in a, what is called lazy, lazy evaluation. So, right, nothing is computed until it needs to be computed, until somebody requests uh, that value. So these are the transformations. And then you also have actions that return value or export data. And actions include count, collect, reduce, and save. Right, save means dump on disk, right? Um, and actions can be applied to RDDs. Um, and actions force computations, right? Once I do count of something, only then the transformations will be run that allow me to, to execute that particular count that I wanted to do and then return me the values. What I really mean by that is that the way you can think of this is that in Spark, you can write jobs like this, right? Where, you know, blue are the RDDs, um, and this is now the flow of the data, right? You can apply map functions, you can do filter functions, you can do group by, and you can kind of write these complex jobs where data is passed in a given way. And when you say, I want a particular, uh, particular output, basically what is happened, that a particular, particular line uh, will, be, will be executed, right? So now, this is a direct acyclic graph that describes how the data is passed through these stages using different operations. And in Spark, all, all this is done in memory. Uh, so all these RDDs are kept in memory and passed across the machines uh, in the clusters, right? But uh, if, um, you know, MapReduce is just this type of structured computation, Spark allows you to, to chain your computation in arbitrary ways, right? So you can have general task graphs. Here is just one example. Um, um, and uh, the system will then try to cache these RDDs and organize them in the proper way so that um, it avoids shuffling, it avoids dumping things on the disk, and everything is fast. So um, there, is, there are other constructs that were introduced in the more recent versions beyond RDDs. These are data frames um, that, that is basically almost like a table in a relational data set and, and um, in the relational database, and then data sets that basically allow us to do type safe object oriented programming on this. But this is kind of beyond what we'll be um, doing in this class. Um, there is a lot of very useful libraries. There is Spark SQL, so basically you can run database queries on top of Spark. You can do machine learning. You can do graph computations. Um, you can do streaming jobs on Spark. So there is a lot of um, application libraries. And then one last thing I will show you is this, you know, is this stack of software tools that what, is, what people call, this is a modern software data analytics stack, right? Where basically you have your distributed file system across the cluster. You have, you know, a system that allows us to m monitor uh, and manage the cluster. One such uh, system is coming from Berkeley called Mesos, which is a resource manager for the cluster, right? Then you have your Spark up here, um, right? Or you can have uh, Hadoop, right? And then on top of Spark or Hadoop, <coughs> you can have different libraries that allow you to run the jobs, right? But the idea is that you have this 
software stacks stacked one on top of each other, right? So on top of the file system, you can do Hadoop MapReduce or you can do Spark um, and so on and so forth. And this is basically how modern large scale data processing stacks look like today across, across all the companies that have um, significant uh, amounts of data, right? So now, how about Spark versus Hadoop? Uh, here's uh, the difference. Normally, Spark will be faster, uh, but with very important caveats. First is that Spark really processes data in memory. So, um, and Hadoop persists it to disk. So, um, if you have lots of data, Hadoop will be better because you don't have enough memory, right? So, Spark will generally outperform MapReduce, but if you need, but you need lots of memory to perform well because all the computations are done in memory across the cluster, okay, right? Um, but as soon as um, 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 you don't have enough memory, Spark will get uh, totally, totally slow while MapReduce uses very little memory, persists everything to disk, it's slower, but kind of doesn't fail, right? So MapReduce, um, um, so this also means that MapReduce easily runs uh, along with other uh, cluster software and doesn't degrade their performance um, while um, Spark kind of clogs the machines and takes all the resources and all the memory it can. So other software kind of the, uh, has harder time to run. In terms of ease of use, Spark is easier to program because it allows you more kind of higher level access to the data. Um, and also Spark is more general, but it is also more resource hungry. Um, this is what I wanted to tell you about Spark um, and MapReduce. Are there any questions? <laughs> about how these things, how these things work and how they distribute, yes? Uh, if you were comparing Spark and uh, MapReduce and Hadoop, like what time difference, or like speed difference would you say you get by using Spark? Oh, I think it's huge, right? Like, it can be orders of magnitude, but it's almost unfair to compare them, right? The reason for that is that Spark assumes that your entire data fits in memory, right? While uh, um, MapReduce needs zero memory. All, like, like MapReduce, all you, all, the amount of memory you need is, I, I mean, in, in principle, to store one key value pair and, or, or, and, and plus the counter or whatever. That's all the memory you need, right, per, per machine. So it's like negligible amount of memory. While, while what Spark requires is essentially to have almost entire data set in memory distributed across the machines. So of course it will be faster if you have enough memory to just juggle things around and don't have to put them on the disk. While Hadoop puts everything on the disk and just keeps this summary statistics, key individual key value pairs in memory and then dumps them and reads the new one. So the usage in terms of memory can be orders of magnitude and then in terms of speed, it's also can be an order of magnitude. It was a good question, yes? So I saw that Spark has like other functions like group by. Um, what else, what other functions can you do with like Spark that you can do with like normal map results? So what has been built on top of Spark is a lot of domain specific libraries that then basically people use, like, like a SQL uh, engine, right? Basically a, an engine to answer SQL queries. Uh, an, a Hadoop based or a MapReduce based engine to answer, to do SQL queries on MapReduce is called Hive. It is developed at Facebook and open source, right? So Hive is a MapReduce based SQL and Spark SQL is a Spark based SQL, right? Hive runs over bigger data but it's slower, Spark SQL runs over Spark jobs, right? Um, I would say the following, in terms of the adoption, um, <coughs> Spark is probably more widely adopted, but on super big data sets, it's still MapReduce that wins because Spark just doesn't scale because it's too memory, uh, too memory intensive, right? But at the end, like if you go here, right, what Spark allows you to do is it allows you to define jobs <coughs> <coughs> that take these RDDs, transform them, filter them, join them, and combine them. 
and that's it. And in some sense, it's just a system where you define how the data will flow. And then the Spark system itself will take care of the computation of creation of these RDDs and how they get passed through. All right, thank you for the question. Great, anything else? Good. Um, <coughs> I want, one thing, one thing I wanna finish with is some problems that are suitable for MapReduce in the last few minutes. So um, things that are very suitable for this type of MapReduce jobs is basically <coughs> where you have a huge file and you'd like to count something, right? Um, or, right, you'd like to kind of process it sequentially and compute some statistics over that. That's kind of perfect for MapReduce, right? So one way to think about it, imagine you have a very large uh, web corpus where um, you have a huge file where it says URL size and date. Okay, so for, you have a, a URL that's a web page, how big is this in number of kilobytes and when did you crawl it? And imagine you wanna find for every host, for every domain name, what is the total number of bytes that that domain name is serving, right? So basically you wanna go and take the URL, extract the domain from the URL and then add up these sizes, right? And that's very easy to do in MapReduce, right? What the mapper will do is it will read a record like this, it will output the key to be the domain name, value be the size, and then what the reducer will do, it will simply collect all the, all the, all the, all the, all the domains um, that, are, that are the same and sum up their sizes and output the final value, right? That's like a one example um, how to do this. Other, th other things that, are, that, that develop well for this is also link analysis and graph processing and also machine learning algorithms can be implemented quite efficiently and well uh, on top of MapReduce. Um, another example, as I was telling you before, is when you build language models, right? Language models are basically models that are try to predict what is the next, next word that is going to appear. Um, and you need this when you do translation, when you do text modeling and things like that, right? How, is, how, is, uh, uh, how are these models generally built? Is basically you, you, take a, you take a lot of text and you wanna count how often does every five word sequence appear? so that you, when you have first four words, you can then predict what is the fifth one, right? Um, how do you do this in, ma ma in MapReduce? It's a very simple extension of what we were already talking, right? Like the mapper function extracts a five word sequence comma count from, from, from the document, and then the group by key happens, and then all that the reducer needs is to combine this, to add these counts together and output the result. And off you go and you have the five, five word sequence comma count over, over the entire, uh, the corpus of the entire web, right? Again, because you can, you can do this independently for every, let's say, web page, then, then the big shuffle phase happens and then just the reduce collects the counts together and outputs the sum of those counts. So that's another example where MapReduce is a naturally good. Another example is, um, is uh, uh, our joins of different tables, right? So basically you wanna compute a natural join between relations, um, uh, let's say uh, R and S, um, and you wanna do this on uh, uh, column B, right? So the idea is if I have my table R and I have my table S and I wanna join them on column B, then the result will be this table where basically what I do is I, say I take the records and then you know, I take the, I match them on, on the value B, but um, I then take the value of A and I take the value, the corresponding value of C. And then again, doing that in MapReduce is, is quite easy, right? I can go through this, I use key here, this is the value, I go through this one, I use this as the key and that as a value, and then I just, I just merge to produce that. Right, so doing join on MapReduce is amazingly easy. I need a map task, a map task, and a simple reduce task. <coughs> do you see how to do this on MapReduce? Clear or not? Yes, so this side, yes, how about this side? Yes, okay, great, how about that, yeah? We, we uh, use the, the items in B as the key, 
Yes. So you have like B1, A1, B1, A2, blah, blah. Exactly. You do the same thing on the other table. And then how do you combine them? Uh, the group by key will combine. But the group by key will just say that B1, A1, and then it'll just say B2, A3, B2. Yeah, right. But for example, what will I find? I will get, I will get, uh, I will get these. So I have key B2, and I have B, another key B2. So this guy, this guy will be will be will be grouped together. So I will just output output them, right? So should be no problem, right? And I can of course. Uh, label that this A3 comes from the from R and that this C2 comes from S, so I know what to take and what to put together. But it should be no problem, right? But I can do this in a in a big distributed way. All right, great, good question. Um, here is here is how I can I can do this. Uh, as I explained, you can check it yourself. Um, what is not uh, problems that basically problems that are great are problems that can kind of be done sequentially. Um, that, and that are large batch jobs. This is what MapReduce is great for. What, what is inefficient, what MapReduce is inefficient for is when you need random accesses. Um, this means when you have interdependent data or when you have graphs where you need to kind of do random accesses to move around. That is less efficient. What is super efficient when you have kind of sequential access from top to bottom, you just scan through. That, that's where MapReduce is super efficient. And then last thing I will say is in MapReduce, when we think of computational complexity or computational cost, we generally don't think about, you know, is it linear, is it cubic, is it quadratic? That's not the bottleneck. Generally, what is the bottleneck is the communication cost. So what we really care about is how much data, how much key value pairs are we producing, how much do we have to shuffle, and how much do we have to persist on disk? So computation itself is not the main bottleneck. The main bottleneck is the communication cost, which is basically how much intermediate key value pairs do we produce and how much of that shuffling has to happen. And that's the main bottleneck. So when you write real world MapReduce jobs, you really worry about the intermediate data size. You don't want that to explode. The, keeping that as small as possible makes your jobs uh, very scalable. So I wanted to finish here. I will just um, remind you to uh, grab a handout. Uh, thank you again for coming to the lecture and I'll see you on Thursday with the first serious topic.